Alrighty, good morning folks and welcome to the Elkhorn Slough Reserve. My name is Ariel Hunter. I'm the Community Outreach Coordinator here at the Reserve and today I'm coming to you live in the field on our annual King Tide Walks. So normally in winter we take a bunch of folks out to take pictures of the big water. Uh, this year, of course, due to COVID-19, we are doing it virtually, but that just means that we can share it with even more of you. And it also means that on this rainy day, you don't have to get wet. Um, this morning, I'm going to be sharing a little bit of background on what tides are and uh, wh how the king tides are a little bit different from what the usual tides we think of as being. Um, and then I'm going to take you to a couple of sites as the tide rolls in just around me here. Um, if you've been out to the reserve, you will probably recognize some of these sites, although they have been transformed by the rising tide. Um, and if you haven't been here before, our trails do continue to be open to the public, although our visitor center is closed. Um, and I encourage you to check out our website, which I'll throw in the comments after this presentation, um, to come out and explore um, and compare what it looks like. I will also be out here tonight at 4 p.m. to show you what the lowest tide of the year looks like. So um, I encourage you to check out both, but as always, these will be recorded and available on our Facebook page, um, as well as some of our other website areas. So don't worry if you can't come to both or if you need to step out early. Um, if you have any questions, feel free to throw them into the comments. Today I am a one woman show, so I will try to keep track of both those and what's going on out here. But if there's a question that you put in that I can't answer during this time or that I don't see, I will absolutely be on my laptop after this to answer those questions. So feel free to throw them in at any time. And with that, let's check out what it looks like right now. So this is what we call our South Marsh Bridge um, on our main two mile South Marsh Loop. You can see in the background there, the hillside and Elkhorn Road is just beyond these trees. And then you can see out here our lagoon, which today looks like a lake. Um, we can't see almost any marsh. And I'll see if our internet holds up enough to take you out to the boardwalk over there to see what that looks like. Um, the tide is predicted to be high at somewhere between 9 and 9.07 a.m. this morning, but those predictions, I believe, are out at the harbor, and because there is a distance of a couple of miles between the harbor and where I'm standing right now, uh, we should see the tide actually go a little bit past that, um, and we'll take a closer look in a second. First, a lot of folks ask us, what tides are. And I know those of you who live on the coast or who surf are probably shocked that anyone wouldn't know what a tide is. But for those of you who don't or who are living further inland, tides are a change in water um, on the coast. And there is what's called a tidal range for any area on the coast. And that is basically the distance between along the shelf, whether it be a sandy beach, a tidal mud flat like we have, or a rocky tide pool. And the tidal range is the distance between the highest high tide and the lowest low tide on average. And what's awesome is because this is a range, because it varies day to day, you get a lot of really curious creatures that live in the tidal range in almost any coastal habitat. Often these are organisms that you can't find anywhere else and they are super specialized to live in this changing environment. I like to think of it as imagine if for, you know, four to six hours every day, twice a day, you could not breathe in your house. Like you're living in your house and all the oxygen disappears for a couple hours and you just have to figure out how to adapt to that. That's what the animals that live in these tidal ranges deal with. Their water rises as the tide comes in and then as the tide goes out, it lowers. And where we are here in Monterey Bay, we see two high tides and two low tides every day. So that means that um, you will see the tide rise and fall twice in a 24-hour cycle. Um, and those tides 
are a little bit different. Um, so that high tide is not the same every day. And the two high tides and two low tides on any day are also a little bit different. And there are a lot of factors that go into determining that um, and go into helping scientists predict tides. Uh, but I will try to skim through the, uh, the beginner's version, which is realistically where I'm at. So tides are a rising and falling of our coastal waters, um, and they vary across the planet. There are some places where they only see one high tide and one low tide every day. So it is different across the planet. Oh, it's on the same one. Huh. Um, so what causes tides, and again, I'm using these visuals because these are celestial bodies. They're a little bit hard to sometimes uh, mentally wrap your head around. So try to stick with me here. The idea is we have the earth here and the earth is covered mostly in water with lots of land as well. Um, and that water is fluid and it reacts to gravitational pulls. So the moon, which is another celestial body nearby us, exerts a gravitational pull on the earth's water. Um, the earth being a much bigger body um, exerts that pull on the moon, which keeps us keeps it in orbit around us. Um, but the moon does pull a little bit on our water body. And what that means is that we end up with a tidal bulge where on the planet, the water actually rises closer and gets pulled by gravity closer to the moon. So as the moon moves around the earth here, it's pulling the water towards it. And that means in some places you're seeing a high tide, right? So if you're standing on this landmass here, and the moon is right above you, that's when you're gonna see high tide. And opposite, when the moon starts to go around and away from you, you're gonna see low tide as that water bulge follows and tracks the moon around the earth. So the main driver of our tides is the lunar gravitational force pulling on our water body. That said, There is also another great big celestial, well, there's a lot of planets and celestial bodies in the universe, but the biggest one nearby to us is the sun. And the sun is clearly a lot farther away from the moon. Um, these numbers are, you know, an average. Um, we're not completely equidistant on our rotation around the sun, and I'll show you that in a minute. But the moon is closer to us than the sun is, which means that the moon pulls more. It, it exerts um, a larger force uh, or a larger visual change on our tides than the sun does. But the sun still has a gravitational pull on our water as well. So both the sun and the moon are pulling on the Earth's water body um, and creating that bulge. And the reason why, or a big reason why tides seem different throughout, or are different, I should say, throughout the month is because of the position between the sun and the moon. So if we're looking at during like the half moon cycles um, each month, we see what are called neap tides, which means that the sun and the moon are juxtaposed. So the moon is pulling one way, the sun is pulling the other way, and Earth's water is getting split. And so that means that you can see as this water bulge travels around the earth, there's a little bit less of a difference between high tide here and low tide here, and then a second smaller high tide. And so at full or at half moons, which again, we see half moons every month, um, you get a neap tide, which is where if you've ever gone tide pooling during neap tide, it is not that impressive because it doesn't change very much. A spring tide, is what we call the tides that happen on full and new moons. So that's when the moon and the sun are in alignment, either on this side or with the moon on the opposite side over here. And what's happening then is both of their poles are combining together. And so that means that the bulge that travels around the earth of water that creates those high tides is actually bigger than we would have seen on a, on a half moon. Um, and there, that, this happens every single month. We get spring tides. They're called spring because they're, they're springing up. The tide's much larger than you see it the rest of the month. These make the exceptional low tide opportunities that happen each month. Um, 
but they're normal, right? This is just the normal cycle. What happens with king tides is the spring tides basically get a little reinforcement. So, and again, I know there's a lot to tides. There's a whole lot to tides. And if anybody in our uh, viewership right now is a tidal expert, please feel free to correct me or to clarify on things that I'm saying because this is uh, really amazing stuff and I encourage you to look into it, but it can be a lot to explain. Um, every year we travel around the sun. We're about to complete that cycle in T minus a couple of weeks. Um, and again, the earth traveling around the sun travels on an ellipsis and we are not equidistant at all times to the sun. So that distance from earlier, the 149 million kilometers, that's the average distance. Um, at some points, like in July, we are actually much further from the sun than we are the opposite time of the year in January. We're closer to 152 million here, and we're closer to something like 147 million here. And what that means is that during this winter time, from roughly November to roughly February, um, we are closer to the sun than usual, throughout or usual compared to the rest of the year. And that means that that pull that the sun is going to exert is maximized just a little bit. And so our spring tides here are going to be even bigger than what we see in the other months of the year. And this is what we call the king tides. And again, the king tides are not a scientific term in the sense that there's, they can happen when there's a storm. Um, so if there's a big storm in July, they can happen um, because of the additional swell from the water that makes it look like the tide is much higher than usual. Um, but they help us to really kind of identify these, what feel like an unusual phenomenon, even though they are natural and um, part of the, the cycle of the tides on the planet here. But what scientists are interested in um, is documenting these king tides because we do know that there is a change in our climate occurring that is, potent that is going to raise the sea level. And we don't know exactly how much it will be, um, but we know that we will see different levels of sea level rise across the planet. And we want to know what the new normal with sea level rise will do to our tides. And so documenting these king tides, which happen once or twice uh, every year, with sea level rise, these will become our tides, our, our spring tides every month. And so if this is the level of swampiness that our local coastal infrastructure has to take on, we want to know about it. We want to understand it and track it um, and be able to prepare for it. So the California Coastal Commission every year since I believe 2011 has set about to go out and document king tides in coastal places across California. Um, and they use that data not just to track are the king tides changing at all, um, but also to report and figure out um, how we can mitigate things like this uh, for the future. So again, if you have any questions, go ahead and throw them into the comments. But what I'm going to do is we're actually breaking off from the tripod here. I'm going to try to walk slowly so it's not too shaky. And I'm going to take you to a couple of these spots so that we can see that tidal inundation up close. Now again, this is what we call our South Marsh Loop. And normally there is a walkway that goes from here all the way out across the way. And clearly today it is underwater, probably in the middle mm -hmm. out here by, I would estimate about two feet, given what it looks like right now. And there's water coming across the entire bridge there. Um, this means that uh, if you were to come and hike right now, you wouldn't be able to cross here unless you had really sturdy mud boots. Um, but it also means that uh, if we have this levee 
out here, it could be impacted by these tides. If this is our regular tide, this is going to change, or our regular high spring tide, it's going to change how we use these trails and how we have to build them. I did notice a question come in that says, on the average, after the moon passes overhead, when does high tide occur? That is an exceptional question. I actually don't know. I used to know, and that knowledge has escaped me. So I will look that up and get back to it in the comments later. Um, I want to point out that across the way, you can see uh, our T boardwalk here, and it's pretty swamped. I'm going to try and walk over there with you all. Uh, hopefully the, the data connection remains the same. It worked last time, but you never know with this stuff. Um, but you can just see barely some of the pickleweed out here that's popping up. And this is our marsh area. And for those of us who will watch this afternoon, um, I want you to really take a moment to look at how much water there is, because it's going to look a lot different at 4 p.m. tonight. Uh, and as we walk, I'll answer. We had another question come in asking approximately how many feet higher is the water at the bridge during high tide um, compared with a, a, and a king tide compared with low tide. So I think there's actually a couple questions that I'm thinking of here. One is um, the difference between a king tide and a an, and an spring tide in any other month. And today somebody put in that high tide is at 827. It'll be different in different areas. So our area um, because we are further back from the main harbor, which is where most predictions come from, um, our high tide is actually closer to right about now. It's 9.05 about by my watch, and the tide has definitely still been creeping in on the side here. But between a kind of, I don't want to say normal months high tide, because all the months are normal, um, but between what we would think of as a normal spring tide and these high tides on the king tides, um, there's about a foot to two feet of difference. So a king tide on average um, is between six and seven feet, whereas your average high spring tide in you know something like July would be closer to like five feet. Um, so you really do see a big change. And when you have storm surge, it can get even bigger. So often, the king tides um, seem even larger this time of year because there's often storms this time of year. So I know a couple years ago, we came out to this tea board walk and the entire bottom portion down here was submerged. And that was because there was an additional foot of water from a storm that had just rolled in. So there's a lot of things that can modify and change these uh, tides and how we perceive them. The difference between the high and the low tide today, today our high tide, I believe is close to 6.2, but again, I'll have to check after this is done because tide predictions are great. They're a prediction, but they're not often exactly the reality that happens, but we should be around 6.2. Probably, we're probably pretty close to that too. You can see the marsh out here quite sunk under the water. Um, and you can see the bridge out there pretty sunk under the water too. The low tide today will be past negative one. So the difference between the high of 6.2 and the low of over negative one is a tidal range of um, seven plus feet. So it's quite a difference that happens. And I'm going to show you Again, I hope that we can get you all out here next year for the king tides because it really is interesting to see how close the water comes up. There's also a ton of cormorants out here today. So again, this is something that we have monitored and been a part of for, I believe, the past five years. Um, on and off and our team has looked at and tracked because we're curious what's going to happen and um, we value 
monitoring and we value collecting data to be used in the future. Somebody asked, how is the SLU preparing to maintain footbridges as sea level rises? Well, oh, sorry birds. They were so camouflaged, I did not notice them at all. Um, one of the ways that we are preparing is by collecting data like this. So one of the things I'll do before I leave is take photos of what the high point of tide looks like out here. So we can actually plan and say, all right, if the model predicts this king tide level to be the one that you know we usually see, um, then we can prepare for that. NOAA, which is the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, um, who oversees the work that we do out here at the reserve with the California, in partnership with the California Department of Fish and Wildlife, they actually have a lot of really awesome tools for predicting and understanding sea level rise models and translating them to what that will look like on the ground in different places across the U.S. And I can share their link um, to a really cool, um, it's an educational tool, but I find that it's really uh, useful for just um, non-educators, people who are just curious about what sea level rise may look like in different areas. Um, and I can share that in the comments afterwards for those who'd be interested in, you know, kind of understanding what that's going to look like. Um, and what the potential models for predicting it are. And yes, we have seen a lot, a lot of birds this morning. Um, it's probably less due to the king tide and more due to the time of year. This is when um, we have uh, lots of migratory birds coming in, including those little sanderlings that were hanging out on this tea boardwalk. Um, they're actually, we'll see what it looks like at low tide today, but... Um, the king or the high tide uh, is not the ideal time for them to feed. So a big reason why they're hanging out on this tea boardwalk is because there is no more marsh for them to hang out in. So at high tide, their habitat is submerged, which is another reason why um, scientists and conservationists are looking at uh, these king tides and trying to understand how they may change in the future. Because if all of the marsh is sunk under the water, that vital habitat is gone. And so one of the things that we've been working on here at the reserve is actually building new uh, salt marsh areas out at our Hester Marsh Restoration Area, um, which if you're curious about it, we actually did a talk with um, Monique Fountain, who is the head of the program that oversees that. Um, and it is in the videos section um, of our Facebook page here. But one of the goals there was to create a um, marsh that has an escape route for the future. So we've actually modified the upland area, the area kind of like what I'm standing in right now, um, just up from the pickleweed to make it, um, to basically make it so that it's uh, usable for that pickleweed if we see a large amount of sea level rise that drowns out the current marshes. So creating escape paths, both for our local infrastructure, like trails and roads, um, but also for our coastal habitats, like the marsh, that rely on tides but don't wanna be completely submerged, um, is a big reason why we are going out and collecting data like this and checking it out. So we are definitely at peak tide here. You can see that the waters come in around the bridge here. And I encourage you, today is actually not the highest of the high. And I did that on purpose because I wanted you to have the opportunity to go out and see tomorrow's king tide, which will actually be a little bit bigger, not much, like 0 0.2, um, but a little bit bigger than today's. And you can check them out in different areas around the coast. Um, you unfortunately cannot come out to the trails here tomorrow because we are closed Monday and Tuesday, but there are certainly other areas around the slough that you can visit and explore. And I'd be happy to share those with you in the comments of this video. Otherwise, as our rain starts to come in here, I am going to go ahead and sign off 
for today. It was fantastic having you out virtually. I look forward to seeing you all maybe at 4 p.m. today to check out that low tide. Um, and again, if you have questions that you uh, would like answered about tides, feel free to throw them either into this feed below us with the comments or into the event page itself under the discussion section. Um, that's my goal today is just to answer questions about tides. So thank you all for coming out. Uh, I hope you stay warm and dry and cozy and hope I see you at 4 p.m. today. Toodaloo!